And you, or am I mistaken? Yeah, everybody's there, so um, we can start. You can start. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, sorry. My video is kind of uh, uh, going through everything. Oh, there you are, Mr. Harmer. <laughs> Jeremy. So tell me when to start. Hi, hello, Shelly. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can. And Vicky, and, did you want to say hi real quick really just so we can... We can hear video. you, too. My video screen has gone in front of all of your video screens so the only person I can see is myself which is not nice um I that's everybody can see you uh, you can if you click on the top um, you can actually move your video thing around where it says your audio video see and nobody else sees that you're the only one who sees that so <laughs> I can see I want you to welcome show. I can see Vicky you can see, okay, good, because that's what you need to do, see, and I'm so glad you were able to make it with your, um, you know, you, you just got back from your music, so that's good. Um, we're going to give about just a few more seconds with, um, j just, we have the, um, a few people coming in from the last session, so um, it tends to build up more. Um, okay. What I do want to tell people here now is that if you're in here, if you could just send a tweet um, and let people know about the panel, because I know yesterday a lot of people came in uh, with these tweets, and they, they sometimes the time zones and stuff. So if you could send it on your Facebook, on your LinkedIn, on your Google Plus page, uh, we would really, really appreciate that um, as well. So uh, we're glad to have you. So we'll go ahead and start the recording, and then I'll go ahead and introduce everyone. And I'll have my video for just a second, then I'm going to take it off because it'll run better. So just tell me when... Oh, you've already started. Okay, good. So thank you so much for coming to Spring Blog Festival. Today we have our wonderful panel, Blogging as an Author, and you will notice these names. I'm going to go with ladies first, and we have uh, Vicki Hollett. She is a language teacher, a teacher trainer, and author with so many popular books she has and courses that she's run for Oxford University Press and Pearson and many, many others. There are just way too many books of hers to mention. So I did put a few you'll see uh, listed. But Vicki has, and you probably know her from her very famous blog, which is Learning to Speak American, but she also has another blog as well. And now she has her simple English videos. She has, and rather than writing books now, she's focused on creating videos. And we're very happy about that because if you've seen the Simple English videos, which you can go to, um, it's free to enter the site so you can see everything, um, or you can go to vickihollett.com and see them. They are hilarious and wonderful and uh, very, very cool. You can even see a dog um, speaking, uh, which is my favorite one at the moment. <laughs> He, I'm going to go ahead and go to Dr. Cheryl, and Dr. Cheryl Lentz, I was actually introduced by Nellie, Dr. Nellie Deutsch, and she is the international best-selling author, professor, and speaker known as the academic entrepreneur. The world is in, as she says in her own world, the world is in desperate need of leaders who are willing to take risks to blaze new trails, to question boundaries, to take our society into the future. And a lot of people follow her on Twitter, and they also have her book, The Refractive Thinker, and she has plenty of other books as well. I think there was four or five I counted. Um, sometimes it's leadership, she says, is with a grand gesture. Sometimes simply leadership simply comes softly. We need innovators, critical and refractive thinkers, and leaders to be audacious and bold, to question what we are doing and why, often asking why not. We need those willing to search for answers to questions and not yet even ask. And many of you were very privileged to catch her session earlier today, so you can find out a lot more about um, what, she, uh, what she writes about as well. Um, so don't forget to catch the recording. And now we go on to Mr. Jeremy Harmer. 
um, who is a dear friend. <laughs> so is uh, Vicky Hollett, by the way, <laughs> and has taught in Mexico and the UK and is currently on the faculty for the MA TESOL at the New School University in New York. He has trained teachers and offered seminars all over the world. Among his writings are the How to Teach Writing, How to Teach English, The Practice of English Teaching, of English language teaching and the prize winning essential teacher knowledge and tons of other. He is all published by Pearson. He's the general editor of the Longman How to Methodology List. Uh, away from ELT, Jeremy is a performer of poetry, prose, and music and has recorded two CDs, Touchable Dreams and Other Love Songs. I've had the privilege of seeing him perform. Um, it, and with Steve Bingham, and also have seen his uh, plenaries, and it, he just will blow your mind. So um, I'm going to go ahead and go on to this panel so you, all of them can blow your mind. And I'm going to take off my video now. Only hear my voice. And we're going to go ahead and start with the first question. Please follow them on Twitter. I have all of their stuff. Um, listed on the bottom so you can follow their websites and on Twitter as well. So we're going to start with the first question. I'm going to go with ladies first and uh, we'll go ahead and go with Vicky and then Dr. Cheryl and then Jeremy. And uh, we will begin with when and why did you begin to blog? So you can tell us the history and stories about your blogs. Vicky? Excellent. Can I check that you can hear me fine? Yes. Yes, yes <laughs> wonderful. Okay. Good, good, good. Um, well, I started, uh, in fact, about 2009, I think it was, or it might have been a little bit sore. And what had happened was I'd moved to America, and as you can tell from my accent, I'm actually British. So I, I found myself learning to speak American. And there were all sorts of interesting things about the language. And I thought, if I don't write these down, I'll forget them because I'll get used to them. So I also ha I was interested in pragmatics and sociolinguistics and all sorts of interesting things were coming up to do with that. So I thought I'll start the blog and I'll write it down and then I'll have a record and I'll go back to it at some point and write a book about it. And I've never got round to writing the book but I think I might start making some videos about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just went on from there. Um, in the end, I split up the blog because I had all sorts of teaching materials so I wanted to, to share as well. So I put them on vickyhollett.com. And then, and then um, a year or so ago, we set up Simple English Videos. So we sort of moved, I, I started focusing much more on video and a site for learners with that blog. So that's my story, really. <laughs> okay, and now let's go to Dr. Cheryl. Well, Dr. Cheryl has a very interesting story to tell, but please don't share with my students because they might be a little bit frustrated. The fact that my blog started actually as a result of frustration, maybe a little bit similar to Vicky's, in that I needed to write things down for my students to help get excited because I was not getting thrilled after teaching now for 14 years on faculty at five different universities, and it's hard to get excited about introductions, bodies, and conclusions, and all kinds of other writing fundamentals. So as I started to learn with technology, I got to the point going, could I clone myself? Could I find a way that they're not reading their syllabus, but they might read a blog, they might read a video, and I happen to be able to get that as a matter of efficiency so that I could get excited the first time or the 10,000th time that I was asked the same question, and then to have what I'm termed now doc in a box. As my students now can see me all over the world in any time zone as often as they want at their convenience and I don't need to physically be there with them. So it really becomes the first time that I could scale my time with using the blog and videos to be able to be part of that teaching in the classroom and realize that I'm just not that voice behind the Wizard of Oz curtain. But I'm actually a live human breathing professor that can really connect with them. So it really started out of frustration that, like Vicky, it moved into so many other areas that I didn't even anticipate. I may have to split off this blog again too, Vicky. So I applaud you for doing that. I may have to go that direction. <laughs> I think you brought up some interesting points that I will touch on again about your blog and students, because I think that's, that's a good point. So remind me of that if I don't bring it up. <laughs> and now, Jeremy. 
Well, I've, I've just checked, and my first blog post was on the 24th of November 2009, so me and Vicky are kind of um, contemporaries, I guess. Um, it was, it was a, in the world of English language teaching, it's when people suddenly started writing blogs, so I got the bug. But I, my motivation for writing blogs is purely selfish, I'm afraid. It's, it's <laughs> what I like to do is write a blog post about something that I don't quite understand or that confuses me and then hope that people will come along and comment and, and, and help me out of my confusion. Uh, so that for me, the, 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 the beauty of a blog post when it works is when people come along and comment. And, uh, and so most of my blogs are either about, um, my blog posts, they're either about um, issues to do with teaching and how to teach and what we should understand about it. Um, and they deal with topics like, like uh, um, the, the value of English as a lingua franca. So that gives me a little contact with Vicky and, and her American. Um, uh, but they're also about things like how people learn and so on and so forth. But then there's another category, I write about presenting as well, because I spend a lot of my time presenting talks, uh, just as both of you do. And, uh, and, and so I like to write about issues to do with presentation, you know, about the gender problem of plenaries and that kind of thing. Um, uh, and then I blog about music sometimes. So that's what mine is all about. It's about um, putting, putting out a... a not a problem exactly, but a sort of thoughts you have and, and worries you have about stuff, and then hoping people will come along and talk about it. And I think you'll enjoy the picture that uh, Sylvia had picked. Actually, she's the one who picked it, so it, sh it showcases you over your guitar there. <laughs> so I thought it was just a lovely picture. Um, so Thanks. one of the questions I want to ask you was, uh, and we'll start this time with Jeremy and work up <laughs> uh, is uh, well. Actually, we'll give you some time to to breathe there, and we'll start with Dr. Cheryl, and then we'll go Jeremy and Vicky. Um, what was your earliest post that generated the most dialogue, or maybe, and it doesn't have to be the earliest post, but one that you remember that just comes to mind that you think uh, was just such an enriching dialogue that you had, Dr. Cheryl. Part of my deal is, I forgot to tell you guys when I came to the party, apparently a little bit late. I didn't start mine until January of 2011. So I came in there. But what really got my attention was the videos. And part of it was trying to be able to be the kind of professor I always wanted to have had, but often didn't. And so having the ability to have a blog that could both have both text and videos and have options for my student really got students thinking. And even to this day, for, what, five or six years later, that I'm still using that Animoto um, platform to be able to create a, a blog video that can teach about me, students comment it as their most favorite. And unfortunately, it's not me who gets the credit, it's my dogs. And when you look at the, you know, I interview, you know, inter or introduce myself, you know, I'll put my credentials and my pictures and all of my bestsellers and books and all the things. But when they see the vacations I've been on, throwing the first pitch out for the, um, the baseball game in Las Vegas with the mayor of Las Vegas, my rescue dogs, George and Gracie, and it's just amazing that they just like it to be real and they can feel that I'm just a presence in the classroom rather than just a name. And that was amazing that what really started doing much more videos because it really connects with them. It makes a difference and it generates discussion. So even if it is about the dogs, so it's okay. <laughs> and was there one particular post where your students just seemed to really respond and um, that the, the you just felt like they really connected with that you can think of? I know you've been uh, blogging shorter, but... <laughs> Right, yeah, I did my, for, and earlier blogs were quite lengthy and, wi and winded because what I thought I would do is take some of the lectures that I used to actually type online, which would be pages and pages and pages, and I would just put what I thought were short vignettes, but they weren't. I think the information when I first started blogging about teaching APA format, and teaching APA is much more of a show and tell because we expect a lot of formatting issues for students, and uh, it doesn't matter whether they're undergrad, grad, or got doctorate, but they don't often see, we tell them what's wrong, but they don't always see what's right. So when I started posting checklists and I started posting, here's the show and tell, I could hear the, ah, you know, even though they're reading it. And then I could absolutely see that at the end of the week, their writing started to improve. And now, and it was amazing because a lot of the same stuff was in the classroom and different tools, but they didn't use them, but they did use the blog. 
So that particular one is if I could get them to actually get excited about APA, and that's kind of like, you know, watching paint dry, but it was still helpful to the realm stronger, so. Um, I, that's a very interesting because, and we're going to move on to Jeremy next, but uh, Jeremy and I just had an email discussion this past week about APA and the formatting of how to reference something, so uh, he can kind of identify with that. So Jeremy, can you tell us one of your earliest posts? <laughs> just to follow up, Shell, from what you just said, um, I'm writing a, a, another book at the moment, and it, it's a lot more difficult to reference than it used to be. And, um, and in particular, you know, when you're referencing ebooks and stuff like that, that's a bit of a nightmare. So I'm sort of learning how to deal with that. Um, two posts I should mention. Um, one is uh, a post which I, I guess I just alluded to, which is I just wrote a post about, about why in teachers' conferences frequently the balance, the gender balance of plenary speakers is so unequal. Oh. And I wrote a post about that because it concerns me, and that attracted a lot of um, comments. But but it didn't attract as many comments as, as the big one was. Uh, I wrote a blog about something called Dog Me or Teaching Unplugged. Uh, I'm not quite sure who's here in this session, but essentially Teaching Unplugged very very quickly. It, it all started about 11, 12 years ago when one of our colleagues called Scott Thornbury said that people should stop teaching with course books and stop teaching sort of grammar patterns and just concentrate on the conversation in the room without any technology, without any of this, without any of that. And, and he argued passionately about this and lots of people got very excited about it. Um, and, and, they, uh, uh, and he used to have a Yahoo group, if you, if, if you can remember what a Yahoo group was like. And people would post thousands and thousands of comments about this. And so some 11 years after that, I wrote a blog post about it because I, I, I like to critique it um, because it's about what teachers around the world do in classrooms and what material they have to support them and whether, um, whether the kind of ideology that allows for free communicative interaction is appropriate in many situations. Anyway, so I wrote a blog post about it. That garnered 225 uh, really impassioned comments uh, for and against what was happening. Now, many people get many more comments than that, but of all the blogs I've written, that is the, the biggest, weightiest, great big, massive one I've ever done because of the comments. Well, we have a, a couple of uh, people in the chat box um, who are very familiar with that. Um, Hayda says, uh, that she loved Joe Harmer and Thornberry debate. So, uh, and and I know Tony Gurr and Adam Beal are here and uh, are familiar with don't this. Don't we don't well. do the technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Vicky, uh, what was one of the earliest posts or that generated a lot of dialogue for you? Um, there are a couple again. One was <laughs> one where basically I I described various American words that were false friends in British and American, where I'd screwed up and, and made faux pas. And I asked for the comments from the readers for their examples as well. And they were, they were full of them. I mean, they were terrific examples, much funnier than mine. Um, so that one springs very much to mind. And the other one actually ties in very much with what Jeremy was saying earlier, Jeremy, when you said, you know, I like to put up stuff that I'm still working out in my mind and hope that other people will contribute and, and I'll get there. And I did a whole series of posts on sarcasm. And in mm. fact, sarcasm is, is a false friend in lots of ways in British and American because it doesn't mean the same thing exactly. It does in some contexts, but in, there are other contexts where it doesn't. And that was terrific because I had so much help from the readers in pinpointing what those differences were. So those, those are the two that spring to mind. And when it comes to the, to the video blogs, um, the, the video. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I and think welcome if you to the new the school. Dog in it, um, we it have the great fortune the of having um, two of ELT's most hit. respected um, and influential also, actually, voices with us here tonight. I think if you go for something Jeremy that's, Harmer that's a very and Scott common problem, like make and do system those. <laughs> but those are the, some of the ones to 
I've attracted a lot of dialogue. They are longtime girl. colleagues and friends, yeah, well, and I, they are both faculty on the new school's MAT Like I mentioned at the beginning, <laughs> that dog one that you did was just brilliant. It was, it was just so wonderful. <laughs> okay, and now I want you to um, share, and we'll go ahead and start with Jeremy this time, um, and work up is uh, what blogging highlight or moments would you like to share like those kind of uh, moments where uh, sort of if you hadn't had a blog they wouldn't really exist like maybe um, where you had an aha with that you used with the book or maybe you had one of those teachable moments with your students that uh, if there was never a blog that it, it just wouldn't have been possible so we'll start with you Jeremy uh, the one blog I did, which which is really an aha moment for me, but again, it's because of the comments. Is I wrote a blog about um, based on a, a woman called Natalie Phillips at Stanford University, and and the, to make it brief, she did an experiment where she put people through an MRI scanner while they were reading Jane Austen, and she got them to read for pleasure, but she, then she did it again, and she got them to read in a concentrated way, and she I heard this on the radio. Uh, and then went and looked for her online and she surmised that when people were reading in a concentrated way they got a higher brain activity in different parts of the brain from when they were reading for pleasure on the very same day um, I received the ELT journal through my letterbox in which uh, someone a great expert in extensive reading said exactly the opposite uh, said he, uh, sorry um, seemed to confirm what she said because he said reading for pleasure um, is not really um, it's not worth it you need it doesn't have enough focus you need to read with direction and so on and so forth which is quite a challenging concept for people who believe that getting students to read for pleasure is the best thing you can do and in particular it, it, it seems to knock out of the out of the water um, um, Stephen Krashen's uh, whole comprehensible input uh, idea that you know if you if you are exposed to comprehensible input in a in a low anxiety um, situation, you will acquire language. So I posted about this and saying, "Hey, what does anyone think?" And and the very first person who um, who turned up on my blog was Stephen Crash and saying, "Bah, I don't agree with this. This is rubbish." And then lots of other people came along, and I learned something. I was I was very provoked by by the responses I got. There's a guy from the University of Swansea in Wales here in the UK who, who described what he was doing and how he'd moved away from reading just for pleasure to reading for pleasure and then mixing it with the study of reading. Another young guy called Jez Uden who's... Anyway, I'm, I'm, the detail is unimportant. What is important is that in this case, as in many others, my thinking was was quite seriously kind of provoked and... and um, you know, are challenged by what people came along to say, and those are the. Um, that's that's why I blog a bit intermittently, I have to say. But that's why I blog because hoping exactly for what you said, Shelley, for these, you know, the aha moment. That's what it's all about. I think that's a great point to uh, bring up because sometimes when people and this blog festival um, that Nelly has organized and set up and it's it's really wonderful, but. One of the things is it's for people who are new to blogging or who have are deciding. In fact, I got a response yesterday that said, "Thank you. I've been really deciding whether or not I'm going to blog." And so, for them to hear um, some of the tough moments too, that it you're not always going to get. Like you said, you were provoked, um, and and you know that it's good for them to hear that. To hear that it's not going to be all the time. You get really. In fact, it's good if it's not all the time those yay you wrote a blog or that's great or I love your it, it's kind of sometimes those moments you talk about that just uh, provoke you that you're just kind of responding. I don't want to take up any too much time but but that for me is important and it's and it's sometimes and you know very well Shelley and, and I'm sure we you know every now and then on some people's blogs you can feel things getting a bit edgy and and but, but that's part of the deal, and people soon learn some kind of, of etiquette about that. Of course, you've got to remember that, I mean, my brother is currently hanging around in Spain with his partner, and since we're on the subject of dogs, they've got a dog 
called Bracken. And so my brother just blogs about his happy holiday and puts pictures of his dog on his blog. And that's beautiful too. But that's an entirely different kind of type of blog and, and what it's for. As I say, it's very interesting listening to the three of us. And I'll stop in a second. I think we all, we do it for slightly different reasons, all three of us. And they're all very valid, those reasons. And it's fantastic that if you just think about it, 2000 and for 2005, no chance to do this thing and to be in contact with other people who, as I said, provoke me and, and stuff like that. Isn't it fantastic? I think so too. And with that, Dr. Cheryl, do you, uh, would you like to share your aha blogging moment? Well, when you were talking about things that don't go well, um, brought up to mind where my trainers, when I had hired them and was new to the blogging world, they always told me, Cheryl, don't be afraid of blogging. You have to go out there and don't be afraid of feel failure. And I, and I actually have a, a mantra that I use is fail faster, succeed sooner. Well, yours truly failed really faster when they told me I couldn't break a blog, but I've actually broken mine three times. And by that, I mean completely did something goofy that the blog completely disappeared. Not once, not twice, but three times. And so when you're talking about those aha home moments, the aha was really about the, the delicacy of the actual technology. And that when you get in the moment and you get in this conversation and suddenly it goes whoop, as we've discovered here, is to be able to keep your wits about you when the technology doesn't always quite cooperate. And when you're expecting to do something and suddenly someone can't see the link or they can't participate or their link disappears or the entire blog disappears. So that was the first thing that really got to the point going, oh my gosh, what do you do when technology doesn't work and it's intended to? And of course, it always happens at the most inappropriate times. You know, you have finals, you have a big presentation and suddenly it just disappears. So the other aha moment that got to the point is, and this just happened recently, actually, is when I've been doing this for years. I mean, literally, the first blog was January of 2011. And only recently, in the last three months, did a university actually ask me to remove my blogs and remove my videos. And I was really taken aback and thinking, going, you know what, this has been using for effective students. They've been doing some wonderful things. They've been helping me create some of the blogs. The editing checklist has been fantastic when I actually had them help me create your top 14, again, getting excited about APA, who knew, that they would have a checklist of here's what you need to do for every paper so that you could have a much stronger writing style and you could capture some of the things we're trying to teach because APA format, no one really gets excited, but it's still important. And so when the university comes to me and says, Carol, we just quite don't know what to do with you. You know, you're one of the founding faculty that we've had and we don't like some of the commercial stuff. We don't understand the andragogy. We don't understand the research. Where are students really benefiting from it? So instead of learning about it, they just have me completely remove it. And for one university right now, I am really flying blind because I can't use it. And it is very difficult when I have to completely avoid using things that I've been using for now four years and creating to help my students. And now I have the inability to help this one particular class. And I'm actually going to stop teaching for this university until I can figure it out. Because it's like teaching with my hands tied behind my back. There's so much amazing things that are out there. And when you're told that you can't use any of them because of the fear factor, it just really was a wow. It tells me that there are a lot of <laughs> quite understand the blogging capabilities and how it can apply for teaching in there. And then I have the other four universities who, again, are throwing me parades. And not only are they asking me in how to encourage me to put things in the classroom, they're asking me to teach their faculty how to do it. I think it's amazing. So again, as we're talking about with Jeremy was saying, you have some very strange reactions you're not quite expecting. And it took me a little back. But when you are a pioneer and you are doing and stepping out there where there are no paths, no one's ever done this before, it really was an aha moment going, you know what, I have to be patient and I have to help teach them and help perhaps guide them instead of privately being completely upset going, oh my gosh, you know what, what have I done that's upset them? Instead, it's a, I've gone way too far ahead where they can't yet follow. And so this is something that has been some really big, interesting things. And if you go too far and frustrate too many people or get too far ahead where they cannot grasp, then you're not going to be able to have the influence and the impact you want because then they take away your tools. And right now they're in the background trying to figure out what this all means. And until they do, they don't want anything. And that to me was initially a bit insulting. Now I actually understand it. And I'm trying to be able to be the leader to be able to help guide them through this process and hopefully have them use some of what I'm doing as an example that they could potentially follow. But initially, 
it was very, it was, it was hard going, wow, I've been doing this for years, why now? Why if what I'm doing is upsetting as opposed to encouraging, particularly when you can have some reactions from some universities that are just, oh my gosh, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread and peanut butter, and this university is, it's the worst thing that they've heard, ever heard, and they're struggling. So it's a not now, but not, or not forever, but just not now until they figure out how to get a handle on it. And change is dangerous. Change is difficult, and change management is fearful for many. And we have to be the guiding lights, the beacons, the educators, the examples. And sometimes that's hard in situations like this. And quite frankly, I didn't expect that at all. So I think it's good that you bring this up. And um, that is something, when someone starts to blog or even has a Twitter, or, and we'll talk about microblogging in a bit, but whenever they put themselves out publicly, it's, it's good that we kind of go, not good that we kind of, but that we talk about these certain stories because they do happen. And I remember I was talking with uh, one of my keynotes um, that I have for the Reform Symposium, that conference. Um, he, one of the reasons why I do these online conferences too is because um, some of them, uh, the, the people out there, um, like for him, they actually, one of the schools, um, because of a blog post he wrote, um, actually d d told them they didn't want him to speak because they didn't um, like his, his stance on an issue. And it wasn't really, I mean, that it wasn't anything that was so controversial or anything like that. that but I, I think that that's good that you bring up these points because when people decide to blog, that's a risk they have to take. And um, I think it's a good one, like you said. I think we have to be the examples. We want our students to be able, like you said, um, to talk about these issues, to question. I think there's a very popular quote with that. So thank you for bringing that up. And could thank I you. Shelley, could I just oh, yes. <laughs> um, the, the, what, this digital literacy you're talking about is really important stuff, isn't it? Whether you're blogging or Facebooking, well, kids aren't doing that very much anymore, or any of the other things we're talking about, training especially young students to understand what digital literacy and privacy means and what to do about passwords and identities and making sure they understand that once you've written something online it's there forever. That's really important stuff, isn't it? Well, there's one other thing, if I, I may, is that I teach my students, because I teach a law and an ethics class, believe it or not, and I'm not an attorney, but I teach them you have to be prepared for all possible answers. And while this is one particular case where, quite frankly, I was a little bit shocked because I assumed that an online university would be, if not digitally fluent, certainly um, concerned and passionate about digital fluency because that was the target market of their students that they were serving. So to actually pull the plug and pull this back really was a bit shocking. And so, Professor, take my own advice. And so now I'm having to try and be lifting up and, and help guide them rather than being a bit insulted that I just wasn't prepared for that type of an answer for that type of expectation with regard to digital fluency. So yeah, that's some take a little longer to come along. I'm hoping great things will happen for them in the next six months. So. Well, and I know, Vicki, you have also experienced some stuff with your videos. I know that the uh, that comes into kind of this digital, oh, like uh, Jeremy was saying too, about the... YouTube is amazing because on YouTube, you know, you'll have all sorts of um, swearing, I hate you, you, whatever, and all this sort of stuff as well. Um, <coughs> but you look at it and it's YouTube, so of course you do. And, um, you know, I, I, I find it very interesting though because um, what's happened, what Cheryl's point here, um, it wasn't an issue that I even thought about when, I, when I've been blogging, really, um, because I've been operating as an individual, so I haven't sort of felt obliged to go and get an institution's endorsement in any way. Um, but at the same time, there was an aspect to it that perhaps other bloggers might feel if they're thinking of going online, which is, um, I wondered if it was going to affect my personal privacy. Uh, it, some of it is impression management, but you can manage what you write, and that's that. But I, I didn't, I wasn't planning. A, I, I guess because I'm not producing a dog, which is about what we have for dinner, and the 
and what we cooked here and where we went there and, and that sort of thing. It, it hasn't impacted me that way. But I did, I, I remember when I very first started thinking, I don't know that I want to expose my private life to the world on the internet. My private thoughts are much easier to expose, I guess. <laughs> well, and that's, I guess, the thing is we're all talking about is anytime you put anything out there, there's the staying power of the written word and the risk that you really are putting out there and how far are you willing to go. I mean, I'm not quite sure, but my nap, one of my jobs is now a bit compromised because I put it out there and I'm not willing to go back because I think I'm really right in the direction I'm going. But it is scary and it can affect people's perceptions and potential jobs. And I know I've gotten chastised uh, quite a bit, actually. And I will say this because uh, Adam mentioned this, uh, Bill, in his uh, presentation yesterday, um, which is really great, um, that uh, he said, because I'm British, I'm prone to. And uh, I, uh, some of my British friends, actually, have been the ones to chastise me and tell me, Shelley, you need to stop putting things out there. And, and one of the things about sharing is what I say is, well, I wouldn't even be me. I wouldn't even uh, be able to do this incredible stuff if I didn't share. So, um, I think Shelley, I think Shelley, you know, you should really ask Roscoe whether he feels comfortable with all the sharing you've done about it. <laughs> my dogs always get going on my videos too, so it doesn't matter your accomplishments, the dogs have it. That's it. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. So, Vicky, would you like to um, tell us any other uh, moments or aha things that y you would um, in either the videos, simple English videos, or um, teach um, America, uh, learning American? <laughs> Sorry. I think it's great when you when you have that person who you admire um, writing. You know, I'd like I wrote I've written a post where I've been referencing watch. Uh, what was it, Kate Fox, who did Watching the English, and then she suddenly popped up and wrote on the blog about something I'd written. It was, I mean, those sorts of things are magic. But actually, something we haven't perhaps touched on, but I'm sure we've all had, is friendships we've built up from amongst our readership. The people that I didn't know before, and now I feel quite close to, and a lot of them I've never even met, but I feel I know them. Um, because we've we've interacted in the chat in the uh, discussions, and um, that's magic. And, I agree. And, mm, and that's 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 all I had to add there, Kelly. Oh, well, I think that's very lovely, and I, I would agree with you. Um, and I think going on this, uh, maybe you want to expand more. Um, because I think part of that is also Twitter, and this is uh, microblogging. So the Spring Blog Festival, we don't only touch on um, just you know what we think of as a written blog, but also there's microblogging. And each of you um, is on Twitter, and I know you've interacted and built friendships there. So uh, did you want to expand on this with uh, Twitter? Um, when and why did you begin to microblog? Um, I wasn't. Just, I'm not terribly good at microblogging. I feel, always feel a bit frustrated that I can't type more words. I love Twitter because I love the links it provides for me, and I love the way people share stuff there. But I see it very much as a place to share links, whereas it's in the in the discussions in the chat of my blog and other blogs that I visit that the I get to feel like I'm, I make the friends. I don't know how other people feel about that. Do you feel frustrated by that, that character limit in Twitter? That's good for Dr. Cheryl. <laughs> The reason I started Twittering, tweeting I guess is the correct word, is because of a bad habit that I have is sadly living in too far in the ivory tower I think it is, is that Dr. Cheryl, even during my doctoral thing, I can write long books, I have 19 bo books to my credit and the last international bestseller one that I had was actually the hardest one to write because it was the most simplest one to write and the most concise and precise and to be honest, Twittering, tweeting, I gotta get the right verbiage here, 
has actually helped me in getting out of the ivory tower. It was when I'm limited that I can't spend all of these long dissertations and you know soliloquies and all this I you know ivory tower stuff that you have to get to the heart of it and get to the point. And my husband's an engineer. And I actually had to learn to text because he works in special places where you could not have a phone. And I was limited in text. And then one of my coaches moved me to Twitter just because we were moving through the social media platform. But I, like you, was very frustrated because you know if if four words are due, Dr. Cheryl will find 15. And my husband is like, is if 15, you need to find four. And so forcing myself to use Twitter has actually helped in my brevity. It has helped in my conciseness and my clarity. And I've had to sometimes agonize over a 140 character Twitter post more than any of the writing that I've done on the blog because it is so limiting. So in anything, Twitter tweeting has helped quite a bit to help crystallize some of the things because again, I may, if there's four words, I will find 20. And uh, right now I have to learn that less is more and tweeting has really helped as is texting. However, I have to be careful when I switch hats because I don't want to write a book in emoticons and I can't teach from a doctoral platform with that type of slang, but that brevity and conciseness, however, does help crystallize a problem statement. And a lot of things were, again, that I came for. I could write 40 pages today. Writing four words for a tweet, I'll agonize for hours. So I'm with you. <laughs> and Jeremy? Hello, Jeremy? Um, I think I'd, I have to say that uh, when I started tweeting, I guess in about 2008 or something like that. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello? Hello, what's happened? We've got... Uh, oh, we can hear you. Uh, am I back? Yes. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, then I'll go. Um, okay, so I started blogging in about 2008 or something, and I have to say, without any exaggeration, that it changed my life. Growth out of Twitter that I never expected. Um, uh, the first time I met Shelley was on Twitter, for example, and that was years ago. Um, but it wasn't just her. I met this extraordinary class of people from all over the world. Uh, and, and Twitter to me is extraordinary because it's non-hierarchical, it's not ageist, it's gender neutral, it's just a wonderful, wonderful environment in which people meet. And for about three or four years I tweeted religiously and I, people shared links to professional sites I'd never heard of, I, I heard about stuff, I laughed a lot, um, I learned about people's lives, but mostly for me Twitter was a great big uh, continuing CPD, continuing to development tool, and I absolutely loved it. And I loved the fact that after Twitter had been going for about a year and a half, and the community I live in had got to know each other really well. When we met up at international conferences, you had the best friends you could possibly imagine, even though you'd never met them face to face before. But when you met them, uh, it was like meeting an old friend, and and I absolutely loved that. And I found Twitter completely compelling. But the story changes a bit for me and for many of my colleagues because after we'd all enjoyed this warm bath of professional development and friendship for, for three or four years, people sort of started not going there so often and getting a bit fed up and then, then migrating to Facebook or something like that. And that's what happens, isn't it, with, with all the social media. People don't necessarily stay around all the time. And then in my case, it all got mixed up because... Um, I've had terrible trouble uh, with Twitter. I've seemed to have lost my password and I can't get it. So I just set up myself a new Twitter name, uh, Harmer J E L T at Harmer J E L T, and that will have to be my Twitter handle from now on because I can't use my old one. But then nobody knows my new one, so I haven't got any followers or anything. But that's neither here nor there. Um, the point, the point of the story is, when Twitter worked, has worked. It's been the most extraordinary uh, um, professional networking um, software you can possibly imagine. And also the 140 characters, I've really enjoyed that, trying to work out how, um, how, to, how to condense thoughts. But anyway, that's my story. I, th I think it's... Oh, sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
I was just going to say, I still think it's it's one of the best sources for links to interesting content and new things in our sphere. Um, it tends to be, I mean, I tend to find more there actually than Facebook or, or wherever. Twitter, I think, is still the place to find the good links. I would agree with you, Vicky, but the only challenge I have is Twitter moves so darn fast and there's so much information out there, particularly when you're connected to, you know, first it was a few people, it was easy to track, then it's hundreds, now it's thousands, tens of thousands of people. But it moves so fast that if you're not on it all the time, you can miss so much. And that to me is almost a little bit stressful. That was to Jeremy's point. Sometimes I have to find another medium that is a little less stressful and moves just a little bit slower so I can feel like I'm grasping more of the conversation. So, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and skip the next question and uh, move to here. I think you all have uh, kind of covered some of those. So I'm going to go on to, because it's been such great dialogue, and I, I know there was at least one question uh, by Tony Gurr, so I'm going to try and get that in. But um, before we go, I want to ask each of you, would you recommend authors blog and microblog, or do you think one is better than the other, or um, what are your opinions on that and why? And we'll go ahead and start with Vicky. Okay. Um, I think both, and then I'd like to add another one to that, which is to uh, blog, or rather to create video materials as well. Because, hey, we're language teachers, we can put language in context in videos. So I'd recommend yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <good>. <laughs> Absolutely. And here's why. I mean, before I became a published author, it was one of those fascinations that you have with authors that you just don't want the words on the page. You want to know about the person who created them. And so when you have authors who blog or microblog, you get to know who they are. I mean, I'm amazed now when I have people that who now write forwards for me who were my heroes when I was in school. And now we do lunch and now we do Twitter conversations and now they're writing for me. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these are my heroes and my teachers and now I'm a colleague of theirs. And the more that we can get into, share a little bit about that personalness, that who you are as opposed to just the book you wrote, I think that there's a tremendous opportunity of connecting so you show you're real as opposed to just that best-selling author or just those words on a blog or a professor in a classroom. The more real you can be, and I think blogging and microblogging, when you share your opinions and you risk being human, it can be really important to connecting with your audience, whether it be students or whomever your readers are. So I would agree. And video is very helpful. Thank you, Yeah. Oh, I, I, there's, there's, there's no question about it. Um, the fact is, you know, everyone, and especially in my field, you know, teachers often work and live in their own small environment, which is jolly nice, and they have their own student, their own school, their own staff room. But the real beauty of blogging and microblogging is that you suddenly you're start, you suddenly have a global staff room. You can make you can make contact with people from all over the world who share your your doubts and your fears and your successes and everything. It's it's the most wonderful way, one of the most wonderfully democratic ways I can think of. Of, of, of sharing our experience, pooling our experience, finding out what it feels like to be them and you all at the same time. Uh, I, I, think, um, uh, I think blogging is my favorite at the moment, though I don't do it enough, for the reasons I've, I've, I've said, because conversations are somewhat more thoughtful. Some of the Twitter conversations I've been involved with go, and they go bam, 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 Cheryl was saying how fast it is, and she's absolutely right. It just goes, if you're not paying attention, it just goes boom, past in a flash. And if you are paying attention, you can't do anything else and you don't do any work and every, your life goes down the pan. You know, so it's, you've got to be careful with Twitter, which I love. Um, but blogging allows for more considered sort of thought because if you put a blog post and people do come along on comment, and they don't always do that, by the way, um, but if they do come along on comment, you've got time to think about it and time to consider your response and they've got time to consider their comments. But, but, uh, all I can say is is that if is is um, and I feel very um, I feel somewhat uh, nervous being in Cheryl and Vicky's company because I've only d put a couple of video little video pieces on my blog because well I just haven't and you're all experts and stuff but but I am um, I what I would say to anybody any author 
uh, any yeah okay let's just say or oh, this is the place where you get to share and learn and get opinions of all sorts of people um, and 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 I say for me as, as a, a writer about teaching methodology it's this great global staff room it's wonderful and I've learned so much from people some of whom are you know about a quarter of my age and some of them are older than me a whole world of people with with incredible opinions which which have made my made my life a better life to be honest brilliant way to say that very touching um oh well not <laughs> well we'll take audience questions too um but what i do want to ask because we do have about eight minutes was uh if there's any audience questions you're more than welcome to post that tony gur asked um he says public blogging was described as vanity publishing and he got in a big debate about that and what what are your thoughts um as far as that goes and how maybe to caution those who because definitely there are our teachers and um, authors and and student or and people who will be starting a blog and microblog and may approach it in a way that seems like vanity. So maybe some thoughts of how you were able to um, avoid that because I think all of you have created really incredible uh, blogs and and use it well. You get people to think and you use a lot of creativity and I, I applaud each of you for that. And you put your heart and passion, which we've been able to hear in your voices. If I could start on that one, that would be uh, something that I talk with my students all the time is just because you can doesn't mean you should. The hardest part about any social media is not everything and every thought you have is something that should be shared with others. I have several doc students right now who are doing research regarding the effects of social media to include blogging and Facebooking and a few other things that are out there. And it's affected their career because right now there isn't a policy where it's illegal for someone to look at all of the things you have said. And remember the staying power on the internet. You can find stuff from my rescue work back from 1998 when the internet was still around. It never goes away. So if you are young and impressionable and are the Gen Y generation, I have a, a stepdaughter who's in her 20s right now, that sometimes there are things that ought not to be shared. And there are things that if it's very dark and personal, it's going to affect you negatively in some way. And again, just because you have that thought or just because you can share it doesn't mean you should. And trying to share that with this generation of how their thoughts could affect their future employment, their public persona has been very difficult for some of my students until they realize they lost a job because of it. So that is the hard part about vanity publishing because having a blog means that you can publish anything at any time for anyone in the world as long as they can find you, your opinion is out there. But people are going to make judgments about you and they're going to have perceptions about you and you're going to have to be okay with them and when you're not, what do you do? Right now I'm struggling with career choices because of the things I'm doing affecting employment. Well, when students have specific opinions, and I don't care what it is, abortion, gun control, um, blogging in the classroom, they, you put those in Facebook, employers can go back and find any public space to capture your comments to influence a future hiring decision. And that's the danger. So that's my biggest two cents here, if I may, is to be, if you're okay with the consequences, then you're okay. But if you're not aware, ignorance can really hurt you here. It's, it's interesting, the term vanity publishing, because in the past, in the days when it was publishers who published books and there was no self-publishing going on, vanity publishing would be when the author paid themselves to get their book published. So it was, it, that, that, that was then, and now is such a different world in terms of publishing, because actually a lot of self-published authors are very successful authors. So you've got this new branch of publishing where it was vanity publishing in that the author paid for it, but the author's raking in far more money than they would have made if they'd worked with the publisher. So it, it, it's a curious term now, and I'm not sure, I'm not sh I would like to have spoken to the person. Tony, what did the person say? Can we bring Tony on? And hear what they were what they were implying when they said vanity publishing. What was the implication? 
Uh, yes, we can bring him on, um, and I will let Nellie do that because she's so great with his technical stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. Okay. I think I think the the people at the so-called university would be very upset, uh, Cheryl, at the fact that Dr. Cheryl, sorry at the fact that I do technical uh -huh. things. How dare you, Nelly? Is that why you got your PhD? So you can manage technology on WizIQ? My gosh, shame on you. So uh, we've got a few seconds. Nelly, how is a compliment? <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Cheryl knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, it's the academia. <laughs> I own it. I mean, it's a refractive thinker press and Finzero press. And I exactly to Vicky's point is that we have a unique model that academia is having a hard time with because academics need to publish. They want to publish, but they can't get into the top three tier publishing. So what do you do? Do you just not get published? But this. I, 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 for me, two or three quick points. Number one, there are some bloggers I know in my field who are very vain. And after mm -hmm. a bit, you stop reading their blogs because it's all about them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's really interesting. Except, of course, that there's someone you really, really admire. They can be as vain as they want and you'll read them forever. And that's what celebrity is all about. And you read these silly people, but because for some reason you're obsessed with them, you read them. But I, for me, what I would advise a new blogger is, you know, don't just tell everyone how wonderful you are. That's not what it's about. Blogging is much more interesting than that. It's about it's it's a shared space where where we can discuss and discover and 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 if you've got something really interesting to tell us, tell us about it. But but the accent is on the interesting thing you've got to tell us, not on not necessarily on you. Uh, and then to follow up very super quickly to what Vicky was saying and Cheryl was coming in about it, the fact is uh, publishing is is going weird right now. And and and, and I mean I've spent my life. Uh, as a, as a writer and yeah exactly like Vicky said I work with authors and editors and stuff like that well they they all think they want to go digital and they don't want if you really want to continue to be an author now you're probably going to have to much better than vanity publishing Vicky is quite right authors need to really work out how to self-publish uh, and and that doesn't mean you're a bad person or a vain person um, people, people who wrote books and had them published by publishers weren't bad or vain. Well, I am terribly vain, speaking personally. But, I'm, but, but I'm, the fact is, but the fact is, we write books because we 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 feel we want to, and publishers publish them. But publishers aren't going to publish in the same way anymore. Uh, and and so authors have to self-publish. And one of the ways of of making sure people know you self-publish is to microblog and blog and things like that. But the issue about it is not to tell everyone how bloody wonderful you are, because if you do that, I think it gets uninteresting. Yeah, and I think Tony we have came to go. Yeah, he I... came. Tony, sorry everybody, we have to go because we have yeah, Benjamin sorry. from Mexico. Uh, but we want to go on with this. If you could just uh, take a look at the link that uh, Tom has added, and I'm going to add, um, so we can continue the discussions, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, we really should have done this for 90 minutes. Um, I don't think uh, 60 minutes was enough, so sorry about that. And Tony, um, sorry we couldn't get you on because you don't have your mic open. You only have your webcam, which is really ridiculous. I don't know. If you're talking and through your sure, webcam, I would like to thank all of the panelists. Please follow them. Um, we've put throughout the the time their Twitter handles and stuff, but you 